The green verdant plains of Mogor are home to the noble Torin. Their ancestral homeland is nestled in the foothills of the Stone Talon Mountains to the north and protected by natural wall mountains on all sides. The only pass through these mountains leads into the barrens to the east. Hello everyone and welcome to episode 2 of my Torn Hunter Let's Play series on the hardcore version of World of Warcraft. A land of windswept mesas and grassy plains, Mogor is the Torn's ancestral homeland. Centaur often send raiding parties into Mogor and the Torn, now with the help of their horde allies, beat them back. Torin are naturally a nomadic people, and their tent cities are scattered across the landscape and change with the seasons and the weather. Now that they are members of the Horde, the Torn have constructed several permanent settlements, including their capital of Thunder Bluff. Mogor provides bounty for the hunt, as a diversity of wild beasts roam the rolling plains and climb the foothills of the surrounding range. In the northern section of Mogor, the mesas of Thunder Bluff tower above the plains, casting long shadows. Bloodhoof Village is centrally located, surrounded by the clear waters of Stone Bull Lake. And further south, on the protected cliffs of Red Cloud Mesa, Camp Narachi stands as the principal training camp for all young Torn. Despite the serene landscape and the pine-scented breeze, Mogor is fraught with trouble. Brambleblade Ravine and the sacred red rocks are overrun by Quobor. The Goblin Run Venture Company infests the three sacred water wells of Mogor, as well as their venture coal mine in the eastern mountain face. The Windfury Harpy tribe lay claim to the extreme northern reaches of Mogor and the southeast mountain face. The Alliance makes its presence known at the Baeldun dig site, where dwarves scour the mountains for traces of their shrouded ancestry, and a tribe of gnolls known as the Pale Mane make their home at the cave called Pale Mane Rock, as well as scattered camps along the southern mountains. This rich plain was once used by the night elves as prime hunting grounds. When the great sundering shattered the world, mountains pierced the earth and the night elves fled north. The mighty Torn made their home upon the low valleys and high plateaus after the night elves left. In time, the ash of upheaval disappeared and the once fertile grasslands returned. The aggressive centaur claimed the right to the grasslands and have warred constantly against the Torn for supremacy of the land, but the Torn's mesa strongholds have so far proved impregnable. Mogor is a landlocked region, with Desolus to the west, the Barrens to the east, the Stone Talon Mountains to the north, and the Thousand Needles to the south. Mogor is the ancient homeland of the Torn, who live on the windswept mesas and roam the grassy valleys. Below the mesas ridge lines are the vast emerald plains, which hold an abundance of life, including prairie wolves, young kodo beasts, and tall striders. The centaur horde mercilessly hounds the Torn throughout Mogor. The teepee-like tents and crude hide huts that comprise Torn Town stand in stark contrast to the turning windmills and pulley structures that keep the Torn grain mills operating. Large, ornately carved totems dot every street and stand above every major structure. Toward the eastern border, Quobor displaced from Duratar have started creating dens with thorned hedgerow barriers. For now, it is a small concern for the Torn, but if the bristly boarmen encroach too far, there will be a price to pay. At present, the Torn are far more interested in what the centaur are up to. Morgor is filled with a variety of antelopes, rabbits, and wild boar, making it the ideal place for game hunting. A Torn pastime involves hunting these animals to improve one's combat skills. The Torn rarely eat their prey, preferring to graze on wheat and grass that grow wild in the valley. Once nomadic, the Torn met with Thra and his orcs when they landed on Kalimdor. Looking to the orcs for protection, they saw kindred spirits with honor and power. When Cairn led his people to Mogor, they came upon what is now called Thunder Bluff. They constructed their capital city upon the lofty mesas, and the city is now a center for trade and commerce. Ruling over the Torn in his old age, Cairn looks one day to hand the mantle of leadership down to his son, Bane. Mogor has temperate, rugged hills, plains, grasslands, some rugged mountains. Mogor is a sheltered and pastoral valley, surrounded by mountains on all sides and accessible only through a pass to the southeast. Resembling a huge pasture, the area is covered with the verdant green grass and a few trees. An oddity of the landscape, the tall cliffs of Thunderbluff tower over the fields in the center of the zone. 
Mogor is home to several Torrin of status, from the base camp in Camp Narachi, Chief Hawkman sends promising young Torrin out into the world, in Bloodhoof Village, Mo Thunderhorn leads the effort to cleanse the Mogor water wells, and from his post on the road east of the village, Morin Cloudstalker seeks to eradicate the foothold the Venture Company has established in the land. Bane Bloodhoof, son of the Great Cairn, has been chosen to chief the village named by his bloodline. With the orc's help, Cairn and his Bloodhoof tribe are able to drive back the centaur and claim the grasslands of Mogor for their own. For the first time in hundreds of years, the Torn had a land to call their own. Upon the windswept mess of Thunderbluff, Cairn built a refuge for his people, where Torn of every tribe is welcome. Over time, the scattered Torn tribes united under Cairn's rule. There are a few tribes who disagree about the direction their new nation should take, but all agree that Cairn is the wisest and best suited to lead them towards the future. Though the noble Torn are peaceful in nature, the rites of the Great Hunt are venerated as the heart of their spiritual culture. Every Torn, warrior or otherwise, seeks identity both as a hunter and as a child of the Earth Mother. Torn who reach the age of maturity must test their skills in the wilds of Mogor and prove themselves in the Great Hunt. The Venture Company has invaded the region and taken over the Thunderhorn Waterwell, Wildmane Waterwell, and the Winterhoof Waterwell. For unknown reasons, what appeared to be a small scouting force of Galax Centaur could be found roaming the plains of Mogor. Meanwhile, the dwarves from Bale Modan created the Bale Dundig site in order to excavate the area. However, this incursion was against the wishes of Bane Bloodhoof, who saw it as an affront to the Earth Mother, and as diplomatic solutions failed, the Bloodhoof Torn resolved to drive the invaders out by taking and breaking their pickaxes. At the same time, the Torn directed Horde agents to clash with the Harpies, Quobor, and Gnolls that reside within the region. During this time, Horde agents were able to drive the Venture Company away from the wells, thereby restoring it to Torn control. The sun is shining bright upon the plains of Mogor, and we are now level 10, which means we have unlocked a very special class mechanic as a hunter, where I have not been to my skill trainer yet, so there is some new stuff that we can learn, and I have many other quests that we can do, but I really want to focus on this quest here called Taming the Beast. But first, let's go ahead and talk to the hunter trainer, where we can get Aspect of the Hawk, which is our second aspect. So Monkey increases our dodge chance, and Hawk increases our ranged attack attack power. We also have a new tier of Serpentine, and we can also learn to track humanoids, which I think I'm going to leave for now because I want to save the four silver for now, and I'll probably pick this up later. But let's go ahead and throw Aspect of the Hawk onto the bar here, and we get that cool sound effect, and then I'll get the new tier of Serpentine on the bar there. But let's go ahead and pick up this quest called Taming the Beast, where as a hunter, we can learn how to tame a beast to fight alongside us. And in order to do this, we have to go through some challenges where we have to tame a few different beasts around the plains of Mogor in order to basically like learn how to do it effectively, pretty much. So the first is to tame an adult plains strider. So let's go ahead and head off this way and we can go ahead and find a plains strider to tame. And this quest is a little bit dangerous because we kind of just have to let the animal hit us a bunch and we have to make sure we don't die. So we have to be very, very careful as we do this that like if we think we can't get it in time or we can go ahead and run the first one should be pretty easy because we have an adult plane strider right here with nothing around it except that wolf way off in the distance and I can go ahead and get like the max distance here so it has to run like all the way to me and let's go ahead and do this where I am just channeling this and I have to channel it for is it 20 seconds or something and as long as I survive, we're in normal World of Warcraft, if you die, you can just come back and try again. But in Hardcore, if you die, we are dead forever. So it looks like we got this Plane Strider tamed, and we now have a special pet bar here. Except since this is just us learning how to tame this Plane Strider, we are not going to have this permanently because we're going to head back this way, and then we can go ahead and turn in this quest, and we can pick up a new one. Where I think playing a Torn Hunter that is a leather worker because I decided to pick up leather working earlier in the episode is a very cool thing because you just have so many quests because there's like a skinning quest and a leatherworking quest and thunder bluff and then you have all these hunter quests so you get like a lot of experience which is nice but let's go ahead and use the taming rod to tame a prairie stalker so we have to go like up north here but let's go ahead 
and dismiss the plane strider which might not attack us okay we're fine but let's go ahead and go across the bridge here where it is actually the lunar festival right now which is really cool so there are a ton of elders all across the road where we have one elder blood hoof right here that we can go ahead and chat with and we can get a coin of ancestry which is basically just some currency for the lunar festival where we can buy some special things but i see a flatland cougar and a kodo bull there and what's this over here prairie stalker over here so let's come this way and only level seven so this should be good for us so let's go ahead and tame this creature and then we just have to wait the whole 20 seconds yeah it's 20 seconds so that wasn't too bad i only lost like a quarter of my health but let's go ahead and run along with our prey stalker which i like quite a bit i really like taming like wolves and like dog like creatures where i'm not sure what the technical best creature to tame is but i think we can go ahead and just tame something that we think is fun but let's go ahead come over here to this hunter trainer turn in the taming the beast and we will get a third one now where we have to tame a swoop where i've gained some experience there and we can go ahead and head back out this way and we can find a swoop and at the same area where let's go ahead dismiss the prairie stalker and he was right there for a second but only level seven but let's go ahead run back this way and try to find a swoop where this is basically showing us like the wide variety of different pets that we can tame because we tamed a plane strider and then we tamed a prairie stalker and now we are taming a swoop we could also tame a flatland cougar i do not believe that we can tame kodo but that's okay but there are some other creatures around here that we could tame as well if we find them like we could go back to red cloud mesa and tame a battle boar if we wanted where I'm keeping my eyes out for a swoop and I just see a lot of plane striders and stalkers and cougars around here. But I just love running through Mogar. It's just such a beautiful zone and it's awesome to see Thunder Bluff off there in the distance alongside the swoop off in the distance. So this is going to be a little bit of a trickier one where I see one over here as well that I might come to because I don't want to get attacked by another creature as I do this. So let's go ahead, tame this swoop and hopefully nothing comes and attacks us in the next like 17 seconds, 15 seconds now that we have left where I see these two animals coming right this way. Okay, one of them turned around, but this prey stalker is still coming. And let's tame this. Okay, we tamed it. Let's get out of the way. Okay, that was a little close, but we are fine. And we probably would have been fine if they decided to attack us because we would have gotten the swoop and then we could just run away. And then we could have like sacrificed the swoop <laughs> to attack our different enemies. Where I'll show the pet system in a second, but let's go ahead and run back to the hunter trainer where we can turn this in, Taming the Beast, and uh, we will get Taming Lesson, which teaches Tame Beast, Call Pet, and Dismiss Pet. And then we can speak with Hot Thunderhorn on Hunter Rise and Thunder Bluff to get Training Lesson, so we can go ahead and learn some more stuff related to Taming. But let's go ahead and dismiss this swoop, and we can go ahead and run towards Thunder Bluff, which I have been to Thunder Bluff on my Orc Shaman, but I have not been to it yet in this Let's Play series. So let's go ahead and run over that way, where I think I want to go ahead and put on another action bar here, and then I'll reload my UI for Questy, or just reload where i'm gonna go ahead and throw my leather working up here i think and then let's come down into beast mastery where we can put tame pet on our bar but i don't think it's something we necessarily oh, i'll just put it up here i guess but then we can get dismiss pet which is very nice and then call pet so basically we can use tame a beast on any beast around the world and we can attempt to tame them which is very nice so we can go ahead and kind of choose one of these animals around here to tame as our first one and i have a couple of ideas but we'll get to that in a moment but once we tame our pet we can dismiss the pet so which will reduce his happiness which we'll look at in a moment but it will just be dismissed and won't be running around us but then we can call the pet to summon the pet to us and then soon we will learn three more things in just a moment but we have to run into the beautiful thunder bluff where as i am recording this episode and definitely not when i upload this episode or well, maybe maybe it'll be a month from now who knows 
the Dark Moon Fair is currently going on, which is really cool. And I guess we'll just pass by it really quickly to see that very fitting. There's actually a petting zoo here where there are animals from all around the world here. A Chasmodan ram, a pygmy cockatrice, so or how you pronounce that, a uh, one hornsley, which is like a little mini thunder lizard, and a bunch of other stuff. And of course there's stuff going on with the Darkman Fair, but I'm not too interested in that right now because I am more interested in going into Thunder Bluff, which is actually a little bit of a challenge on a hardcore character because Thunder Bluff, as we can see here, is high up in the sky on top of these bluffs. And there is an elevator here where we need to be very, very careful because we are on hardcore where if we fall off of the elevator or fall off of the city, we could potentially tie in a very dumb way and lose our life. So we just have to be cautious about this, where every now and then the elevator will bug, which is a little disappointing, and we could lose our life if it does bug, but let's go ahead and jump up onto here, just stand in the middle, and then we can go ahead and use this amazing piece of Torn technology, which is maintained by the Torn engineering trainer here, I believe, and he just keeps all of these things active including the windmills and everything around here in working order where i have a quest here that i can pick up called preparation for ceremony and uh, there are some other quests around here where i believe it is also the love is in the air festival so like the valentine's day festival so we can see that there's a quest somewhere around here and then there's also a quest over there. But I'm gonna go ahead and take a quick detour from the Hunter Rise to come to the central tower here so we can go up to the second tier of the city, which is where the skinning and the leather working trainers are because there are two quests over here that we can go ahead and grab really quickly, which should give us some experience. So we have Varen Tost right here where we can get gathering leather, which will give us a new piece of leather equipment here and we can also get a Kodo hide bag which I do not currently have all of the leather for all of these right now but I guess I'll go ahead and do this one first where we can get this and then I'll come back with some leather and turn that in in the future and we could make some bags which is really cool but I'll go ahead and upgrade that really quickly and if you look at the Kodo leather bag right here Kodo hide bag it is a six slot bag which we currently have three six slot bags plus an ammo pouch so we can kind of decide if we want the ammo pouch or not where I kind of like it right now actually but it costs three thin kodo leather which requires us to hunt down some kodo and then some light leather and coarse thread so it is a little expensive to make but let's go ahead and go across this bridge here where we need to be really careful that we don't fall off of the bridge because we will fall to our death there are some places in thunder bluff where you can fall off and survive this i do not believe is one of those places but we are across here but we can go ahead and come into here, which is where the hunter trainers and the warrior trainers are located in the Thunder Bluff. And we can talk to Holt Thunderhorn right here to turn in our training the beast quest to unlock the rest of our training abilities here. Where we can go ahead and come into here, where we now have, what is it, a revive pet right here that we can go ahead and throw onto our bar. So if our pet ever dies, we can just revive the pet. And then if we come up to here, we have beast training that I'll go ahead and throw here, where basically we can train special beast skills that we'll look at in a moment. But there is also feed pet down here that I guess I'll throw right here, where we have to feed our pet. And I'll look at that in just a moment. Where let's go ahead and exit out of the inn here, which is also the entrance to the bluff that we were just on, and come back this way, where we can go ahead and take an elevator down towards Th Mogor once again. And let's go ahead and find a beast that I want to tame. And I think I'm just going to take this elevator because this one is about to go down, and I don't want to like try to jump onto it because I don't want to die. So we can wait for this one. But we can go ahead and pick a beast to tame. And I have some ideas of what I want to do. We're starting off, let's go ahead and try to find a prairie stalker. And I'm very bad at pronouncing that word for some reason, but we can go ahead and tame that. And then we can take a look at what it is like to use a hunter pet. Where I see a prairie stalker right here. So let's go ahead, run up to it and let's tame the beast. Where just like what we did earlier with our practice runs, we have to wait 20 seconds in order to tame the pet. And all while we do this, we kind of are just defenseless right now. And the stalker is just going to bite us over and over and over again. And hopefully we won't die, which looks like we are fine. So we can go ahead and tame this beast. And now we have a wolf 
who is our pet. And we can instantly see here the pet is very unhappy and it only causes 75% of normal damage because we just tamed it. Where in order to increase our pet's happiness, we can go ahead and feed it some lig meat here where it is now eating, so increases happiness feed pet effect and the happiness should go up a little bit and we can keep feeding all the way to its maximum happiness where it has a neutral happiness where it's like 100% of normal damage and then it has like a very happiness state where it's like 125% where I think, oh, it's just in here, where we can come into here, and we can see our pet panel here, where we have a wolf, a level eight wolf, because we tamed a level eight beast, where as we hunt the different creatures, we will be able to increase our pet's level. And that's something we need to like take into consideration. If we're like a level 53, and we come to Mulgore to tame like a level six beast in the future, we have to be wary that, I believe the beast will be level six when we tame it. But we can go ahead and keep feeding that stuff to increase its happiness where it is now content, causes 125% of normal damage, and is gaining loyalty. Where there are six loyalty levels right here. And I think in Classic WoW, if the loyalty level is level one for like too long, the pet will run away and you will lose the pet. I'm not sure if that's actually the case or not, so maybe I'll double check that, or maybe I won't. But basically, we just want to make sure that our pet is well fed all the time. And each individual pet or type of pet will only eat specific things, where if you look at this wolf's diet right here, its diet is meat. So it is a pretty limited diet compared to some other pets that can eat a wide variety of different things. But of course, pets have their own stats and stuff like that. And if we come into here, we can see some of our pet skills where it has bite, the bite the enemy causing seven to nine damage. And if we come into beast training here, we can learn growl and growl rank two, that uh, our pet's not high enough level because only level eight and we need to be level 10 where we have growl here which is basically a taunt skill so we can go ahead and send our wolf in by using this attack button right here the wolf will attack this other wolf here and then it will basically tank the enemy for us as long as we don't do too much damage so basically we can now sit at range with our rifle and just shoot it while our pet takes all the damage and basically holds it in a position for us and then we can go ahead and just launch all our attacks on the enemy while our pet is also attacking the enemy so we have just become significantly more powerful which is very very nice but let's go ahead and run back to Bloodhoof Village because I want to check out another thing related to pets. Where a little bit of a fun fact, we have this character Varjun right here who is looking for someone important. And this character is actually important for priests where Torn cannot be priest characters, but if a troll or an undead makes their way here to Mulgore to level in Mulgore and they talk to this person, this person will remind them at level 10 that they have to return to Dorotar or to Terraswag Glades in order to learn some special priest stuff, which is a very fun kind of like thing right there and like a very random NPC. But outside of every single inn, we have an important NPC for hunters, which is a stable master who is outside of most inns at least, I think. But we can go ahead and chat with the stable master where we currently have our wolf right here, who we can actually name. So we can rename our wolf and I'll go ahead and name our wolf Kaizen because that was the name of my last dog. But we now have our wolf Kaizen and we can go ahead and stable the pet which costs five silver for our first one and then five gold for our second one. So I just used up all my money there. But we can go ahead and just throw our pet into the stables, which basically means we have stored this pet now. So we can come back to the stables and we can go ahead and pull this pet out of the stables whenever we want, just like that. But we can store it, which allows us in the old version of World of Warcraft to have a total of three different pets tamed, where we can only have one active pet and then we can have two stables stabled that we can use later so i stabled kaizen because i want to go look for another pet where the wolf is really cool i like kaizen a lot but i really want to do something a little bit bold because we are on hardcore and if we die we are dead forever and i want to go tame a very challenging pet where I've kind of done everything that I wanted to do on this character and here on out is pretty much just a lot of bonus fun as we kind of see how far we can get and we can talk about some random pieces of lore and story related to the world of Azeroth but if you die I am not too heartbroken so we made it a little bit further than what I wanted to on our last character which is nice but in Mogor there are a ton of different really cool animals 
all around this road. And I saw one yesterday that I've known about for a while now called Mazaranch, I believe is how you pronounce the name, which is a pink plane strider who is like a level 11 rare mob so this mob is not alive all the time and i think in the vanilla version of world of warcraft this is the only pink plane strider in the game i could be wrong about that but starting in the burning crusade there are more of them so in the vanilla version of the game this is kind of like a very special mob to find and we can go ahead and basically just go around to where it hangs out in Mogor and look for it and I think I'll start on the western side of Mogor where I saw him yesterday and I think kind of a nice thing about hardcore right now is that there are not a lot of people playing hardcore because of season of discovery and because people are over it and you know some people play on another server where I'm playing on the less populated server right now actually so we might have a good chance to find this beast and to tame it so this animal wanders around a very large portion of Mulgor which is basically right where I'm circling around with my cursor right here so let's go ahead and roam the plains keep an eye out for a very large pink blob in this green grassy area and just look for it where I'm also tracking beasts right now so we can keep an eye out for that as well where we got some bale dun dwarves up there which i'm just going to ignore and i only see adult plane striders in this area and it was like right around here where i saw this plane strider yesterday but that does not mean that he is alive right now and am i really risking my life to tame a pink plane strider yes yes i am oh i see him oh it's a level nine rare elite okay so I was not expecting to find him this quickly. So let's go ahead and sit right here, I think. I don't see any other players around us, so I don't think anyone's going to interfere with this. And then when he comes into range, let's go ahead and use this. Where we could use concussive shot, but I'm just gonna go ahead and press this. And he is sprinting at me and he dealt 47 damage at me first hit, okay. So we're currently at 71% health. There are some other enemies around us. We are halfway through this. I have a health potion ready in case another animal attacks us. We are very close, though. He's casting something. Okay, okay, we tamed him. That is awesome. Okay, so we have deadly poison right now, so 15 nature damage inflicted every 10 seconds. Let's go ahead, come into here really quickly, where I don't know why I'm still being frantic, but he likes cheese, fungus, and fruit, so let's go ahead and feed him this mushroom here. And then we can go ahead and just run off this way because I don't want to be on the road right now because I'm just scared and we have this poison that's ticking, but we should be fine. I'm just going to eat just to restore some health. Why am I... We just tamed this tall strider here, which is the pink Maseranch, and this is a very, very cool, where he has a special ability called Cower. Cower causing no damage, but lowering your threat, making the enemy less likely to attack you, which could be important for us in some circumstances, but probably not the best thing to have like right now. But let's go ahead and just head back this way, where we can open up our beast training here, where we can learn bite once we get training points which requires us to level him up i believe but we can also learn growl and then we can learn a new growl once it's level 10. but we now have this tall strider right here which i do not know what i want to name the tall strider and i might choose next episode but let's go ahead and send him out into action here where it's just charging and he is definitely much smaller than like the version we just tamed just because of like scaling things with like I think it was a very tall plane strider because it was like a rare mob and then as a pet the plane striders are a little bit smaller. And I don't think this is technically like the best pet for us to have, especially in hardcore where we want to survive, but I think it is a lot of fun. And we have a cute little like a garden flamingo right here, which is a very fun. But that was basically the pet that I was really wanting to tame and I'm super excited right now that we just tamed it and I'm very happy right now. And I think I'm gonna go ahead and continue with questing in Mogor, where if we took a look at our map right here, we still have quite a few quests to do, and we we're pretty close to level 11, so I think we're going at a good pace right now, where we might be like level 13 before we we're finished with Mogor, which is cool. But let's go ahead and continue with all of those quests. I guess really quickly I'll just point out that our plane strider is now on the log in the screen behind our character, which is very cool. The Earth Mother is a gentle, seemingly transcendent and immortal being, worshipped primarily by Torin, although also acknowledged by some orc shaman, the centaur, and at least one frost nymph. As the creator of the land and mother of all creation, her eyes are the sun, Anshe, and the white lady, Musha, and the blue orchid, Losho, is said to have been born from one of her tears. 
through torn mythology holds that she long ago gave all of herself to protect her creations from the corruption of the old ones. It is believed that her love and wisdom is always with the Torn. Through her, the race has deep ties to nature. They believe that she is responsible for weaving the strands of fate, and that just as they are all born of her, they will all return to her in death. The Seers are an order of Torn priests who revere the wisdom of the Earth Mother as illuminated by the light. Before the Age of Memory, before Azeroth had night or day, the Earth Mother roamed the emptiness of the world. Alone, she braved the shadows and whispers that rose from the old ones trapped in the depths, and they could not sway her. However, she was with child and knew she could not labor with nothing to safeguard her newborn from the darkness. She searched for a haven where she could safely give birth to the light of her heart, but found none. She decided to craft one herself and began shaping the world, starting with forming the land and mountains. She created the first sparks of fire by grazing her nails against the mountain peaks, and her fingers cut grooves into the earth from which flowed the first waters and oceans. As she laughed at the antics of these three elements, her breath loosed the winds, which relentlessly cut across the land and whipped up the newly laid dust. To show them how to be more gentle, the Earth Mother breathed upon the fog they'd created and sent it spiraling into the heavens, where it became clouds that gave off the first rains. The Earth drank the rain and offered up the grass, swamps, and forests in return. Having learned their lesson, the winds danced softly through the newly born plants. A simpler version of the tale states that the Creator breathed upon the golden mists of dawn to create endless fields of wheat and barley that became the basin of her works. All of the wilds were the Earth Mother's creation and sanctuary. She grew to love the elements and told them that they would make fine companions for her children, and the elements loved her in turn, providing her with warmth, water, and music when she desired it. Everything was brimming with her essence enough to keep the darkness at bay, and she decided she could now give birth to her children. With the elements' help, she labored until she brought forth a radiant son she named Anshe, and a gentle daughter she named Musha, whom the elements called Sun and Moon. Anshe and Musha formed close bonds with the elements and steadily grew in power until they were able to influence the elements themselves. The Earth Mother was overjoyed by this and gently guided her twins through the ages, but she remained ever vigilant against the Old Ones and their shadows. The Earth Mother eventually grew tired from her work and constant watch and knew that she needed to rest. In order to keep her children close and safe while she slumbered, she pressed them into her eyes. First, Anshe, causing a peaceful night to fall on the land and calm her spirit, and then Musha. After telling the elements to guard against the shadows, she fell asleep, resting first with one eye shut and then the other. Since her children's light was now too powerful to fully contain, when her right eye was open, Anshe gave warmth and light to the land, while her left eye was open, Musha gave peace and sleep to the creatures of the Dawni. The Earth Mother's restless watch, where she was never fully asleep, and her twins' consequent absence from the road caused the land to grow cold and created the first winter. When she awoke, she nearly wept at how the elements had changed. However, as her twins' light returned, the cold faded and everything went back to how it had previously been. The elements consoled the Earth Mother and showed her how her time of rest had allowed new plant and animal life to thrive. And so she named the seasons in her time of work summer and her time of rest winter. She then showed Anshe and Musha how to guide the elements through these new seasons and eventually how to bring about the accompanying changes to the land at will from beneath her shut eyes and her times of rest. Her children's growth filled the Earth Mother with love and happiness, a feeling she wanted to share with the twins. The next time she slumbered, she stretched over the land so that the beating of her heart dug into the earth, saturating it with a song of life. When she awoke, she was surrounded by new life. She sprinkled wheat over these first children of the plains and called them Shuhalo, Torn. An alternate version of the tale has it that the Earth Mother created the Torn by spreading her hands out across the plains of the dawn, with the Shuhalo arising from the soil wherever the shadow of her arms passed. On their mother's request, Anshe and Musha taught the Shuhalo everything they knew, how to work with the elements, build homes, acquire food, sing, dance, ferry the rivers, and hunt wild beasts. The Shuhalo gave thanks to the elements, to sun and moon, and especially to the Earth Mother. They prayed to their mother and swore to bless her name into the ultimate darkening of the world. However, as the elements turned their attention to aiding the Torn, the Old Ones in the depths watched and waited. The next time the Earth Mother slept, the Old Ones stretched their influence across the land and corrupted many of the still young and vulnerable Torn with their whispers, teaching them of war and hatred, 
and causing them to unleash the elements against one another. The distraught Aunt Shay and Michelle awoke their mother so she could see what had happened. Upon seeing how the world she shaped had fallen into chaos, she wept a single tear. She realized that since she was forever connected to the lands and unable to leave them, she might one day also succumb to the darkness and thereby endanger her children. She wiped away her lone tear and then wrenched Aunt Shea and Misha free from her skull, her fingers digging so deeply that their light could never return to her again. Sun and Moon tried to console their mother, but she lay paralyzed by sorrow. The twins decided to set off to hunt down the source of the corruption. Word of the Earth Mother's sorrow and the twins' journey was carried on the winds. The siblings soon encountered a group of uncorrupted Shuhalo who presented a radiant blue infant that the twins realized had been born from their mother's tear. The group was suddenly attacked by the shadows, and though Sun and Moon held off the attack, Anshe sustained a wound that Musha was unable to heal. She sent a plea on the wind that reached the Earth Mother and stirred her from her grief. Though she could no longer see, she found her way to Sun and Moon with the Element's help. She hugged her children in relief and told Musha that her presence was keeping the bleeding Anshe alive. Upon being presented with the infant, the Earth Mother felt a slight joy once more and named the child Losho. Knowing that the remaining Shuholo would draw the shadows to them, the Earth Mother decided to sacrifice herself to contain the darkness. The twins protested, but she quieted them and told them to take permanently to the skies, from where they'd be able to chase away any shadows she could not. She told them to always stay close to each other, so Musha could tend Anshay's wounds and gave Lashaw to Musha while telling the twins to teach the infant everything they knew. Although heartbroken, the twins obeyed her words and took their eternal post in the skies of Losho, while the Earth Mother summoned the element's aid for the last time and stretched herself across the road. She threw her arms wide to create paths that Shuhalo could follow, bent her arms to the wind so she could hear the prayers of her children, and pressed her chest to the earth so that the beating of her heart dug deep once more. She rooted herself and held the shadows fast, giving all of herself for her creations, never to walk the land again, all to make the world safe for her creations. Seeing their mother's sacrifice, Musha guided the tides and the winds so the Shuhalo would always be able to hear and follow their mother's voice while Anshe shone across the land so the way would be clear, all while Losho listened to their lessons. The Torin believed that the Earth Mother's essence still cradles the road under the now present glow of the sun and moons, listening to all that happens and that her love and wisdom will always be there to guide them. When the murderous centaur horde came from the Black Lands to the west and the Earth Mother's Blessed Ones could not defeat them, the Torn were forced to leave their ancestral holdings behind and become nomads forever after. However, it was held that one day the scattered Shuhalo tribes would find a new home under the loving arms of the Earth Mother. And with that, I'm going to go ahead and call the episode good here, where I really hope you all enjoyed watching this episode, and as always, I hope you are taking good care of yourselves. Remember to drink some water, check your posture, and subscribe. And I'll see you next time in the world of Azeroth. Goodbye.